Shanghai this talk and turned it into the Rust talk. So, um, so this is a little bit about Tilda. We started the company back in 2012, and we're really big and proud. And we um, we work on a product called Skylight, and DHH's message yesterday about these uh, being like a small team, being a prepper, and needing to put tools into your backpack that are let you going to let you compete with the big guys actually really resonates with us because we only have five engineers on staff and we're building products that compete with companies that are IPO or processor IPO and yes, like very much, much bigger competition. And fundamentally what that means is that we need higher leverage pools. So when we built Skylight, um, the thing that we really wanted to solve, the thing that really lit a fire under us was that all of the tools that we were using to measure the performance of our applications were reporting averages. And uh, as DHH said, this is basically a DHH love fest to make up for my Twitter feed yesterday. <laughs> uh, so DHH wrote this really great blog post in like 2007. It's like, a, like ancient times, where he said, our average response time for Basecamp right now is 87 milliseconds, which sounds fantastic. Um, and it leads you to believe that all is well, and we, would, we wouldn't need to spend any more time optimizing performance. But that's wrong. Average number is completely skewed by tons of super fast responses to feed requests and other cache replies. <coughs> You have a thousand requests that return in five milliseconds, then you can have 200 requests taking two seconds and still get a respectable 170 milliseconds average. Useless. Uh, and I actually think it's worse than useless. I think it's actively misleading. Um, so instead, what we need are our histograms. We're like, great, we have received this wisdom from DHH. Let's go build a product around it. Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, we built a product where instead of giving the average, you can see a histogram. And this is super important because looking at a histogram makes some things like just so obvious. Like you can see cache hits and cache misses. We call this a bimodal distribution. Um, you can also see the 95th percentile, which is gives you a much better sense of what the average worst case that your customer is experiencing. Um, and we did that all, all using very uh, high leverage open source tools. So our backend in particular is built on a product called Apache Storm. I don't know if you can read below. It says distributed, resilient, real time. I wish we had known when we picked it that that was a pick two list. <laughs> <laughs> Carl had a rough weekend. Anyway, uh, you may have seen our talk uh, last year at RailsConf, which I, when I grabbed the slide, I apparently grabbed all the animations that come with it. Um, but we gave a talk on our architecture, and hopefully you guys really enjoyed that. Um, so this year, we want to talk about a different high-level tool, which is Rust. So our tagline for Skylight, the thing that really motivates us, is how do we give our users, if you're just dumping a bunch of data on them, how do we give them real answers so we sift through all the data and they don't have to? And as it turns out, doing this answers not data approach requires a lot of data. We have to collect so much information. And when we wrote the first version of our agent, which runs inside of your application, we wrote it in Ruby, which is really great, you know, Ruby. Um, but we quickly realized that if we were going to collect the amount of information that we needed to build the product that we wanted to build, Ruby just had some fundamental performance problems that weren't going to be acceptable. What we really needed something, but we really needed a tool that was going to give us low-level control, like a C or a C++, um, but we were afraid because even and I were very mediocre programmers. And we know that we're getting our software to run inside of your application. And the idea of us writing something with like a seg fault that would crash your apps is just like totally terrifying for our particular application. So we needed something that would give us the high level safety guarantees of Ruby, but with this low level control and this low level access. Um, and, and Rust was the answer. Rust came out, it was still 3.1.0, uh, but we decided to make a big set on Ruby. Well, it's 1.0. Uh, well, right. We got semantic version books over here. <laughs> So we decided to rewrite our agent in Ruby, uh, in Rust from Ruby, and we call that our featherweight agent. And this, I have to say, has been one of the best decisions that we've made. It was a very nerve-wracking to bet on this pre-1.0 program language, low level, making all these quite intense promises. Um, but it's been really great because Skylight, the agent now, in addition to collecting so much more information than our competitors, just sips resources in comparison. Because we're writing this code that's essentially operating like C, in addition to better performance and being so lightweight in terms of resources, it also lets us build features that we would never be able to build if we didn't have that low-level access. Being able to write something in native code lets us go a level deeper into MRI itself. So for example, uh, this year we launched a new feature that actually shows allocations. So you can actually see how much memory is being allocated in your Rails app in production which is huge when you're trying to track down memory issues. And we can do that at a really granular level as we build out. Yeah, like to the minute. 
Um, and this is also letting us announce, uh, letting us ship a new feature that we're announcing today called Trends. So Trends is a new weekly email that we'll be, you'll be able to subscribe to. We're launching it this week. Um, you'll get a weekly email showing you not just 95th percentile, but also your medians. And this is a really great way for you to detect changes over time. So the thing that I would ask you to do, uh, Judith is going to get into like the, the meat of the whole matter, but the thing that I would ask you to do is with a language that offers you low-level control but high-level safety and expressiveness, if you're a small prepper team, what can you do? Like what new opportunities and new features in your apps does that unlock? So without further ado, here is Judith with his rush field. Hey. So uh, what Rust is really good at, Rust is not ubiquitous by any stretch, um, but Rust actually enables people like, like you and me, uh, Tom, to be systems programmers. And usually when I say that, I say, oh, yes, Rust will enable you to be a systems programmer. I get a look like this. Like, 
I'm not an assistance programmer, but what are you talking about? Somebody else can be a systems programmer. Um, although, as Tom pointed out, sometimes you don't have a choice. Um, but then, usually when I get asked and I say, no, it's like good, you may want me to end up in a situation like that, uh, people say, oh my god, like, that sounds really scary. Systems programming sounds like super hard. Obviously, I like, played the C a few times, and that was crazy. Um, and also, I said all the time, so it was super dangerous. Um, <laughs> So then you're like, no, Rust is great. It lets you, you know, it's, it's easier. It has some of the high-level affordances. It's also not as dangerous as you, um, as C. It's like safe, actually. Um, and then people say like, oh, so systems programming seems cool, but like, what is that? Like, what is systems programming? Um, so what does that mean? What is the definition? So there's actually a lot of definitions, but I'll just give you my, my personal take on it. So there's like a few different things that systems programming means to me. One of them is you get to write code without a GC. And there's a lot of reasons why you might care. Like if you're a high frequency trader, you care about GC pauses. If you're OS, you don't want to embed enough GC language inside of GC language, right? So there's a lot of reasons you might want to program without a GC. Um, also, programming directly against the metal. I don't mean like the way no people say I'm programming on the metal. Um, I mean literally like writing against the, the lowest levels of abstraction that, that you have access to. And doing that without additional costs, additional abstraction costs. So you shouldn't have to write extra layers of, or have extra layers of cost just to program, uh, talk to the kernel, right? Uh, also, in terms of a runtime, most programming languages have a pretty heavyweight runtime or involved runtime. Usually when people say system programming, what they mean is that there's like either no runtime at all or the runtime is very lightweight and is pay as you go, as you need it, you use it. Um, also, this is like a thing that came out of C++, but I think it's important, is like, you should be able to write abstractions, and those abstractions should not cost. So you should be able to write functions, you should be able to make structures, you should be able to organize your code in a good way, and not have those abstractions add additional cost as you go. Um, and finally, I think the thing that systems programming most is, is everybody's written code, like uh, you write Ruby code, and normally the good answer to Rust is like, well, it doesn't end up mattering. Who cares? Like, I'll just write my Rails app and it'll be fast enough and it doesn't end up mattering. But occasionally you end up writing code where it does matter. Um, uh, this happens basically in every app where there's a performance critical area and it just doesn't end up being true anymore that it doesn't matter and the amount of time that it takes you to get to a reasonable performance is actually more writing in a language like Ruby than writing in a language that's optimized for a good performance. So uh, that's sort of, for me, uh, system programming is when it turns out that the story that we tell ourselves about performance not mattering for the cases where that doesn't end up being true. Um, that doesn't mean a bunch of stuff though. It doesn't mean malloc free. It doesn't mean you have to write an assembly language. It doesn't mean you're writing code that only talks to Unix. It doesn't mean you're writing handcrafted make files. It doesn't mean you have to care much about what the linker is doing. And it doesn't mean that your entire application is written in a systems programming language. It may mean that you're writing using a little bit of systems language for errors where it matters, but most of your app is still written in something like Ruby. Um, so a good example of this, like Tom said, is Skylight, right? So Skylight basically used Rust because we needed to embed a programming language into another programming language, and two GCs is not good. We needed high performance, and we needed low memory. Um, so for all those reasons, we ended up going with Rust. Um, Firefox, uh, sorry, Mozilla, actually uh, is using building Rust for kind of a different reason, which is that they're building a new browser engine called Servo, and for them, they needed to build something that was fast, safe, and parallel. So they really want to be exploring different parallel options. And interestingly, the Servo team is like seven people, so you want to talk about a prepper team, or five people building Skylight, that's seven people building a browser. Um, and they're, they're using Rust because it allows them to explore ways of writing low-level code like what you would normally write C++, you would normally write browser in C++, it lets them explore that kind of performance uh, profile about being able to do parallel stuff. So that ends up being pretty important. So those are all uh, reasons why you might use Rust. Um, I'll talk a little more at the end about Rust and Ruby. But before I talk about Rust and Ruby, I want to talk a little bit about how it works. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about Rust. But before I talk about Rust, I want to talk about sort of how garbage collector works. Um, so here is some Ruby code. You can see I have a very simple structure. I have a class that has a point, that has an X and Y. It's a Ruby audience, so you should know what this code does. It's very simple. Um, and I have a length function. The length function basically makes a new point, a couple of new points, makes a line, and calculates the length. So what happens is I go into this length function, right? I make this point, the point is being created, it goes into the goes into the heap somewhere. Um, I make another point, no problem, goes into the heap somewhere, I make a line, goes into the heap. Uh, of course those that line points at the two points, right? I go I compute the length and then at some point in the future, so that those objects stay there, chilling out. At some point in the future, something stops the world, 
and it goes in and capital, like looks into what's going on, discovers that nobody else needs those objects anymore, and it cleans them up. And that's actually a pretty good story for safety because basically by definition, a garbage collector ensures that you can't use an object, uh, so, sorry, that the object is cleaned up only after it is no longer being used. So the whole concept of like a use after free bug is impossible by definition, right? You have a garbage collector, use after free is impossible, free only happens after use is done, right? That's the point of a garbage collector. But that means that you need a garbage collector. And there's another way of dealing with uh, memory, that is how the methodology for using memory, for dealing with memory in C or C++, and that methodology is called ownership. And the idea of ownership is basically that whoever, whoever allocated the object is responsible for deallocating it. Right? So if I, make it, if I make the object, I have to deallocate it. And the reason why this, this is good, obviously, is that it means you don't need a garbage collector. The reason that it's bad is that now you have to keep track of all that. You have to make sure that you do the right thing. And if you do the wrong thing, if I make the object and Tom tries to free it, basically game over. Now I try to use it later and I get a second goal, right? So the idea of my ownership is how is the methodology for doing systems programming, but historically actually doing it was very hard. So let me try to give a, a simple analogy. So let's say uh, there's me and there's Carl in thinking man pose, and uh, there's a, a bookshop. I basically go to the bookshop. The bookshop says, okay, here you, you can have a book, it's my book. Now it's my book, I bought it, right? So now I bought the book from the bookshop. Now I'm allowed to destroy it or burn it. Not the best analogy. <laughs> uh, so I'm so a good use of the blame animation. <laughs> so because I own the book, I am allowed to destroy the book, right? It's my, my responsibility. I don't have to ask anybody else for permission, right? Now, once I own the book, once it's my book, I can also give it to Carl. And now that I've given it to Carl, Carl is allowed to uh, dispose of the book. And I, but I can no longer dispose of it. I've given it to Carl, it's now Carl's book. So one way that you might think about this is that ownership, um, both in the real world and in the programming world, is basically talking about the right to destroy something. So let me show you basically the equivalent code. Hopefully people can read this code. Probably, probably not, but sorry. N24 by 768. Um, so you can see on the top that there's a book. It's, it's simple if you're like familiar with any type languages, right? It's a book, it has a title, it's a string, it has a bunch of chapters, it's a vector of strings. Then we have a function called main, right? And I'll just walk through what happens here. So what happens here is the first thing is we say, give me a book, read the book out of the file system, and then now the book exists and it's owned by this function. So ownership in Rust is, is usually rooted in a function. So the function that's in the middle being called owned the book. Now I go and I print the book, and that's great, the book gets printed to the screen, and now I leave the function main. So now the function main, as an owner, doesn't exist anymore. And because the function main had the right to destroy, basically Rust will automatically go and clean it up. So you didn't have to do any work. Uh, you should note the lack of manual memory management here. What happened was that because the function main owned the book, and the function main doesn't exist anymore, the book gets destroyed. And that's, I think that's a pretty good starting point if you want to try to do automatic memory management, but of course, if only the function that ever created something is allowed to use it, that doesn't make for very interesting programs. Um, so let's look at a little bit of a more involved, uh, about a little more involved example. And this is an example where I, 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 the main function makes the book, and then it calls the print book function to print the book. And so what happens here is that we make the book as before, now the book is owned by the main function. Now we call the print book function, and the thing to note here is that the print book function just takes the book, capital B book, no extra uh, signals or anything like that. So because of the fact that it takes the book by default in Rust, that means that we're going to transfer ownership. And now what that means is that the main function no longer owns the book. Instead, the print book function owns the book. It does the print line as before, and when it leaves, now it is responsible uh, for disposing of it. The function uh, and the book gets destroyed, as you might expect. Now you might be thinking, okay, so that's cool, but I've written a lot in Ruby, and uh, if there's nothing really stopping me in Ruby from after calling print book, going and using the book again, right? So if you follow this methodology over here, what's going to happen is that the main function is going to try to access a book that was destroyed. And we said before that we kind of need a garbage collector to deal with that kind of problem. So how does Ross deal with that problem? So let's go back and let's look at this example where we do the same thing as we did before, but after transferring the ownership to the print book function, we try to use it again. We try to print the number of chapters. So as before, we make the book. You know, we we put it. We, it's owned by this by this function, the main function. We print the book. We transfer it as before. The book got destroyed. Now we try to go back and print the book. Well, actually, no. 
what's going to happen is we didn't actually get this far. The compiler actually discovered that we did this ahead of time and it says you can't do that. And what it says is you use the moved value. The value is transferred, the orange was transferred into print book and you're trying to use it. And you get a little note that says no, the book was moved here. So in the real output there would be like a little arrow pointing at the print book function. So you say, okay, I see that I transferred the ownership. I'm not allowed to use it anymore. And sort of like I said before, so this is, I think this is fine for simple examples, but you can sort of intuit that this is not the whole story. This is not, you can't really write interesting programs if every single time you want to do something with the value, you have to give ownership to the function that wants to do something with it. That's not, uh, that's not very intuitive. And to deal with that in the real world, uh, in the real world of transferring ownership, we deal with that by saying you're allowed to lend something. So I go to the library, the library doesn't have to give me ownership of a book, it can lend the ownership to me, and then I'm giving a promise to the library that I'll return at a certain point, right? So the way we deal with the, the problems of ownership in the real world is by borrowing, and that's also the way that we deal with the problems of ownership in Rust. So let me, let me give you an example. So I have this book that I got from the library, and I say to Carl, hey, I will give you this book, but you need to return it to me by 5 p.m. on Friday. Right? And as long as Carl returns it by 5 p.m. on Friday, everything's great. Now, the problem is that in the real world, there's nothing enforcing that rule. So I can say to Carl, give me the book back by 5 p.m., and then if he doesn't give me the book back by 5 p.m., it's basically, now I'm in trouble. If somebody else wants it for me, then I'm going to be in trouble. But of course, in the programming language, we can do better than that. So let's look at another example with borrowing. And you're going to notice that this is basically the same program that we wrote before, except this time when we call print book, we use the ampersand uh, symbol before the book, and we uh, put an ampersand symbol before the capital B book on the bottom. And that the only thing that we're saying here that's different from before is that instead of transferring ownership from the main function to the print book function, we are lending the book to the print book function. And it's required to give it back to me at the end, and that happens automatically. So let's, let's look at what happens. So I start off with the, as before, the book is owned by the main function. But now, because I call print book with that ampersand, it gets lent to the print book function. The print book function prints the thing to the terminal, and then when it returns, it gives the book back to the main function. And now, because of the fact that it gave the book back to the main function, when I go to print the line, the main function still owns it. It can happily do that, and everything goes along as expected. So that works pretty, pretty nicely. Um, but there's one additional step that you need to understand how the whole system works, which is the fact that you can borrow, you can lend something to, that you borrow to somebody else. Um, we call that subleasing. The idea behind subleasing is that the first person to borrow isn't the last person who can borrow. And so in the real world, you can imagine, I go to the library, the library lends me a book, and the library says, hey, I need you to return this book by 5 p.m. on Friday. Great. So I, I remember that I need to return the book by 5 p.m. on Friday. And then Carl says to me, hey, I want the book. I want to borrow, borrow the book. So I can give Carl the book, but I can say to Carl, hey, I need you to give me this book back by 4, 30 p.m. on Friday, because I know I need to give it back to the library by 5. So you can borrow the book, but you need to return it back to me. Then Carl returns the book back to me. I return it to the library. Everything's great. Again, in the real world, it starts to get complicated. In the real world, when you start dealing with subleasing, you start dealing with complicated subleasing arrangements and restrictions, and that's mostly because in the real world, people are very bad at honoring the leases that we, that we ask them to honor. Um, but in the, in the programming world, the compiler can enforce it for us. And so let's look at another example with subleasing. Uh, that's just a little more involved. So here, I think the important thing here is that we're able to write the, we're write, able to write arbitrarily involved abstractions just like you would any programming language as long as you follow these basic ownership rules. So here's the function called main again. We're going to make, we're going to get the book. The book is going to be owned by the main function. And then we're going to call print book. And again, we're going to, we're going to lend the book to the print book function. So it gets the book, it gets the book, it already has borrowed, has borrowed it, but it doesn't really know how to print things, so it's gonna delegate that to the print title function, the print chapters function, right? So it's gonna call print title, that's gonna lend the book another level down, it's gonna print line, and then it's gonna return back up, then the print book function's gonna go another level, it's gonna uh, print the chapters, that's gonna go get me the length of the chapters, it's gonna print the line, it's gonna return, the print book function is going to return, and then as soon as the whole print book, the whole main function is done, then it can destroy it. So the really cool thing about all of this is that in all of these, in, in all these cases, I think the way the thing that we're doing is pretty normal, right? It's basically, uh, if you think about it, in most programming, when you call a function, you're basically lending. You're not expecting the thing that you're calling to take ownership and try to like do something with it later. But we have, we have to pay the garbage collection overhead in all programs, all the time, in all cases, because somebody might want to do that, right? And in Rust, the way it ends up working is that 
you start off with this assumption of ownership transfer, and you can uh, you can lend things as much as you want. That that's basically a thing you're free to do. Um, and once once you've done that, now we can completely eliminate the cost of garbage garbage collection across the entire system. So there's one last bit here, which is mutability. So, so far we've been talking about read-only things, and of course you can imagine that if you're only dealing with read-only things, uh, you can lend as much as you want, and anybody can look at it, and of course they can't mutate it, so it's totally fine. Uh, you can have 50 people looking at something at the same time, and it's fine. Um, but what if I want to allow uh, mutations? Mutations add a little, bit of, a little bit of a wrinkle to it. So let's say I go to the uh, library, and the library says, here, you can have this book, and you can feel free to change it. Let's say you can uh, move the bookmark around or fold the corners or something like that. Um, and then Carl says, hey, I want to borrow the book. I might want to say, Carl, you can borrow the book, but I don't want you changing it. And so I can say, hey, return the book on Friday, but don't change it. And you, he returns the book, I return the book, everything is great. Um, again, human terms, this is getting even more complicated, very difficult to enforce the rules. Um, in Rust, it's, again, pretty, a pretty straightforward change to what we've been doing all along. So the first thing to note is that so far, by default, everything that you do in Rust is quote unquote immutable. But when we say immutable, we don't mean that the object is like frozen, there's no like runtime checks, nothing like that. It's just by default, if you have a reference to some kind of object, you're not allowed to mutate it, the compiler will prevent you from changing it. Now let's say I want to, I want to add a new feature here, which is that I have the ability to add a bookmark to the, to the book to say where I'm up to. So now, in order for me to be allowed to mutate that bookmark, I need to, uh, start off by saying, give me a mutable book. Don't give me a, a book, a read-only book, give me a mutable book. And that's fine. Um, and now when I call the print book function, the print book function, before I just called it with the ampersand, which means I'm lending it to you, this time I'm calling it with the ampersand mute, which means I'm lending it to you and you're allowed to modify it. So I call print book with the, with the mute, I send it over. Uh, now the thing to note here is that when print book calls print title, print book says I am allowed to mutate it, but I don't, printing the title shouldn't be mutated, so I'm not going to let you mutate it. And so print book or print title works as before, right? It, it borrows it, does the thing, call print chapters, does the things, same things as before, right? And then at the end of my function, I'm basically going to go and I'm going to mutate the bookmark. So this is a kind of uh, hokey example because print book shouldn't be changing the bookmark. But the key point here is that if you look at the main function, it's clear to me that the print book function might be mutating something. So just by looking at that signature, I can say, okay, I can see that mutation might be happening. And all the other signatures on this page don't take uh, a mutable uh, bar or something. So they, we know that they can't mutate anything. And that, that ends up being pretty important. That ends up uh, helping a lot. So now that I've sort of talked about all the different rules, I'll just recap by saying there's basically two rules of borrowing. You can have as many outstanding read-only bars as you want, so you can, uh, in the real world, again, you can't give the same book to many people at the same time, but on the programming, you can have as many pointers to the same object as you want, so you can have as many outstanding read-only bars as you want. But in contrast, a mutable borrow is unique. Uh, if you have a mutable borrow that's outstanding, no other borrows, mutable or read-only can occur at the same time. And again, it's very important to note that this is not enforced at runtime. It's not like uh, every single time you try to borrow something, it checks to see if anybody else has anything outstanding. There's no like mutable locks at runtime. It's all enforced by the compiler, but this gives us some nice properties. Um, so I want to show you some examples. So I talked about what's allowed and what's not allowed. I want to show you some examples of, of what, what that might look like. So we start off here, we have this function called same, and the same function takes two books uh, it borrows two books, right? And it just says, is the title the same? Is, is the first title the same? Is the second title is, or the chapters the same as each other? Uh, and in Rust, double equals does what it does in Ruby. It does deep, uh, uh, deep comparison, right? And so, and we call same with book one and book two. Obviously, that's fine, right? I'm allowed to lend something to the same function. Uh, these are two totally different books, so that's totally fine. Now, what if I, instead of, of lending book one and book two, what if I call it same with book one twice? So again, because this is an immutable borrow, because it's a, uh, a read-only borrow, this is still fine, even though I'm making two copies of that book. So from the perspective of the same function, those are two copies of the same thing, or two, two different things. The fact that it's read-only means that's safe and we're allowed to do it. So that's still fine. Um, but now what if I make another function? What this function is going to do is going to be called copy. And it's going to take a book, and a mutable book, and it's going to copy the, the read-only book's title into the mutable book's title. 
So here what we did is we said, copy the title from book one into Mutable book two. Uh, so like I said before, that's still totally fine, because in this situation, we have a book one, we have a book two, we're not, there's no aliasing going on, we're following the rules for, for borrowing, to mutable borrows must be unique, that's totally fine. Now what happens if I don't want to change it? And I say, we're going to only get one book, and then I'm going to call, say copy from book to the same book, mutable book. Again, from the perspective of the copy function, it doesn't know that these are the same thing, right? But what ends up happening is that the compiler looks at this and it says, you're trying to have a read-only borrow and a mutable borrow at the same time. That violates the rules of borrowing. So, error. Cannot borrow a book as a mutable because it is also borrowed as a mutable. And it gives you a note that says, the previous borrow of a book occurs here, which is useful. Um, and then it says the uh, previous borrow ends here. And basically at the end of the day, borrowing is the secret sauce of Rust. Uh, borrowing basically allows you to do very, very involved, complicated, um, recursive things that you might think you need a garbage collector, but by following these very simple rules, you get done what you need to get done. Um, I actually want to skip a little bit here because I want to get to the Ruby part. Um, I'm going to skip over the, the closure stuff, um, but the TLDR of closures is that closures follow the same rules as regular, uh, closures follow the same rules as regular functions. So if you're, if you're using a closure and the closure closes over a variable, it ends up having the same rule. So if you pass a closure to another function, um, and the function tries to call it multiple times, uh, and that would, that would violate the ownership rules, it, ends up, it gives you an error. Um, you can learn more about that in the Rust book. Um, so what about concurrency? So the interesting thing about concurrency is that really the problem with concurrency boils down to one thing, which is that shared mutable state is the root of all evil. And there's basically two strategies that people use to try to deal with this problem. So one of the problem, one of the solutions is called channels. The idea behind channels is that you're not allowed to have two copies of the same thing at the same time. If I want to give a value to some other thread, I have to pass it through a channel, and then you basically can't get this. Um, another strategy that's used is functional style, which is that you can't mutate. If you can never mutate anything, then you, don't, you never have shared mutable state. Um, Rust sort of does a uh, combo. It says you can have shared state or you can have mutable state, but you can't have shared state that is also mutable at the same time. And if you think about that, that actually is the exact same uh, idea as the original rules of borrowing that we had before, which is that you can have as many outside and read-only bars as you want, that's shared state, or you can have a single mutable borrow, uh, that's mutable state, but you can't have both of them at the same time. So you can have alias state or you can mutate, but you can't have both at the same time. Um, and if you use more Rust, you'll see that the uh, send trait and the sig trait are basically the ways that internally Rust enforces this. It's not anything special about threads or anything special about any particular data structures in Rust. There's just two traits that represent thread safety, essentially, and any library that's written, uh, like Carl uh, has a bunch of libraries that deal with um, asynchronous I.O. and concurrency, and they're able to implement these rules themselves. Um, just a simple, a couple simple examples here. So we have the spawn function. The spawn function takes a closure here. You can see that if we call the spawn function uh, and we try to access a book from the outside, it's going to tell us that there's an error, and it's going to tell us that the book doesn't look long enough. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, I actually kind of, this kind of has the dependency on the closure and stuff, but um, the basic idea here is that the closure can run at any time, right? So we call it spawn with the thread, that closure can run at any time in the future, but we know from before that the main function owns the book, right? So we can't let the closure run and use the book at any time in the future because we know that the, as soon as the main function gets ex exited, it's going to clear the book. So that's an error. Basically says, the book does not live long enough. This is a uh, compile time error. And if we add the word, or we add move to it, that basically says, this closure is going to be moved out. You can feel free to move anything from the outer scope inside of it. And then that becomes just a regular transfer of ownership into the closure. Um, I'm going to skip the next section. Um, so uh, one thing I didn't talk about, or a series of things I didn't talk about, is sort of high-level productivity. And maybe you got a sense of that from the one slide that I showed with closures. But Ross has a lot of higher-level ideas that are pretty familiar to uh, higher-level programming people, like uh, people coming from Ruby, Python, and JavaScript. So there's things like OO, right? So you can have a, a type and then you can implement it. Um, there's things like traits, which I don't have a, a good example of. But the idea behind traits is sort of similar to Ruby mixins or maybe Ruby refinements, which are like scope mixins. 
So you can write things like happy support where you can implement like a you can implement a method on the one function uh, on the one uh, value, or you can implement you can say like one that based that go, um, or you can implement traits that are used like go interfaces, right? So there's sort of this um, very flexible way of dealing with uh, time mixing type of situation. Um, there's also iterators, which are a, very, a way of doing something that looks very uh, Ruby-ish in the sense that you might map, filter, uh, reduce over things, but under the hood it ends up being compiled to being effectively as fast as the things that you would have written by hand, and that just sort of magic LLVM stuff. Um, there's also uh, enums, which is, if you're familiar with uh, other languages where there's like uh, something with a variant, um, you can have enums, and you can also put methods on those enums, which is awesome. You can also overload operators, uh, which is pretty great, lets you do things that look, uh, look interesting, so you can overload like the indexing operator, but also things like the plus operator. So all that's, uh, all that's pretty cool. I didn't talk about it because it's not like, these are all like cool things about Rust, but they're not part of the big, big story. The big, the big story is that ownership lets you do um, really low level things without the fear of site faults that you would have. And I wanted to show just a really quick demo before my time is up of uh, what that might look like in Ruby. So uh, let me, I should share my screen. Basically, hello? Make it bigger. Oh my god, this is um, So basically I wrote a little, uh, a little rack handler. So this is a rack handler, you can see it's Ruby. Uh, the thing on top here is kind of the interesting part of this, which is I'm using a built-in thing in Ruby called Fiddle, which Aaron has talked about a lot. And I'm basically just saying, okay, I want to load, dynamically load this RailsConf thing that I got from Rust, and I'm going to define three functions. The inker function, the report function, which takes in analytics, and an analytics function that returns in analytics. I make a little class here called analytics, which just wraps that. So you can see it initializes, it calls the FFI layer. Um, it's basically calling into Rust. So all these things that are happening here are calling into Rust. Uh, and then I wrote a little rack handler here, which is just an analytics handler. And when you go to slash report, it calls report, gets a string back, and otherwise it just increments with the request URI. Um, and if I go into the, the Rust code, you'll see that the Rust code is actually uh, pretty vanilla Rust code. I have a structure here called analytics. It has three hash maps in it for host schemes and endpoints. And then uh, when you call inker, it's basically, it basically goes, okay, increment, parse the host, make sure everything is okay, basically fail if it's not even valid URI. And then increment each one of these three hash maps with the information that we pulled out, and then also increment the total. We basically we have some Rust code that does that does what we wanted. Um, now the cool thing here, uh, the really interesting thing here is that you see this. There's this no mangle thing, and then pop extra and C. Other than this, it's pretty vanilla Rust. But by adding these little, uh, by adding these descriptions here, what we're basically saying is, from the perspective of any other programming language that's not Rust, treat this like C. So you can see here, for example, this inker function takes an analytics and a buffer. And if I go back into the uh, if I go back into the config RU, you'll see that that's, right, inker function takes a C pointer called analytics and a buffer, right? So the cool thing about Rust is that even though it has all these high level safety guarantees, the syntax isn't exactly like C, the underlying semantics, if you tell Rust, like this should be usable from C, are exactly the same as C. Um, so now let me just uh, run. Uh, I should actually show you, so uh, Rust has this thing, uh, has a, a Sorry, Rust has a package manager. So there's cargo.toml, which is the package manager description. You can see I have a RailsConf demo, I have some authors. Um, then I have, a, I describe my library, I say it's a dialog, which is important for this demo. And then I say it has a dependency on URL, and it has a dependency on Ruby Bridge, which is uh, a library that I wrote for this demo, which is basically just the thing that gives you the buffer abstraction. Um, and then if I go cargo build, dash dash release, it actually does nothing, and the reason for that, if I run verbose, is that it sees that I already built that. So if I rmrf the target directory, and then run cargo build again, it kind of works like bundle, right? It's basically like, oh, I see you already downloaded those things, so no problem, I'll not download them again, but I'm going to compile them one at a time. It's, you can see that it's compiling the Ruby bridge uh, crate and the URL crate, which are basically the, uh, the dependencies that I listed, and that's automatic. You don't have to do anything other than save it and depend on it. And then I'll just point out in the Rust code, uh, librs, 
You can see on the top here, all I have to do is X, say extern create URL, extern create Ruby bridge, and that's all the code that you have to do to get Cargo to do all to build it. So if you've ever written like C or C plus plus, that's like a billion times simpler uh, to deal with dependencies. It's like writing in a, in a modern programming language. Um, so now, now I'm just going to do uh, bundle exec, rack up configure you. I'm actually inside of a Ubuntu VM, so I have to minus O zero 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 zero. So then uh, let me open Chrome. And I'm going to go to. So if I just go to. No. So you can see uh, it says success incremented Ubuntu.dev. I can go to like foo, like whatever URL. Ah, oh yes. So I had flashed it on the screen, but it's very simple. Uh, if you go back to the configure you, you'll see it's this was a benchmark. Um, you can see that it basically does two things. It's a call, it basically says if your report, then return 200 with the report that we get over the amplifier from Rust. Otherwise, call the incur function again over the amplifier and say success. You can see none of the actual work is done inside of Ruby, it's just calling into Rust through that little fiddle approach. So I can say success, I can do like foo bar, awesome, um, and then if I go to 4992 uh, slash report, you can see it'll give me a report and basically it <laughs> so this is basically the default debug version of that structure. So if, actually, if you go back and look at that structure real quick uh, with RS, you'll see that I derived debug. And derived debug basically just says emit the code that is necessary to print the debugging version. And then if you look at the report, you'll see that the report is literally the same format that the debugging code, and then send it back over as a new debug, <coughs> like a heap allocated debug, exactly like that. So, and this is basically just Ruby printing that same thing. I mean, I called two outside and it. So, uh, you can also see that it's definitely working because you can see Babe Ico, the ICO, is incrementing as I go. <laughs> this is definitely, definitely real life. So, the, uh, I'm basically out of time here, but the key point here is not really anything about this exi specific example, but just to show that uh, Rust Bait produces a .so file which you can load into Ruby. Ruby has a built-in built -in fiddle. Rust is pretty good at Amplify. So um, without that much difficulty, you can take something that might be computationally intensive and convert it into Rust, and then you call it from Ruby pretty easily using like the normal tools that you're used to using. Uh, basically, will look correct. So um, I'm, I, both of these examples, sorry, the example and also the libraries that I use, which are very tiny, are on my GitHub. So github.com slash blackcat is like the last two repos I push. Um, and I'm happy like any time the next few days to take questions about it. Um, program. Thanks. Thank you.